Welcome back, perfect pals and minor acquaintances. My name is Clint Hoagland, and this is Creating Electronic Music with Chuck. In our last video, we covered how Chuck reads from text files and used that to discuss a nice convenient way to write melodies. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about music theory. In our eighth video, we went over how to stick what we called major and minor chords into our Chuck music. What we did not do is discuss what those terms mean or why an array of 0, 4, 7 is quote unquote major, while an array of 0, 3, 7 is quote unquote minor. So today we're going to unpack that a little bit and explore the basics of notes, scales, and chords. Like I said way back in the beginning of this series, my hope is that anyone can pick up these videos and use Chuck to make music, whether they have any experience with either music or programming. I have gotten a few comments from people that mentioned that they were not musicians nor programmers before they got started, so hopefully this is useful for some folks. And if you are a musician, maybe it will be a nice refresher. I find it can be nice to think back to basics sometimes. Regarding the terms and definitions I'm using, I'm using the book Harmony and Voice Leading by Edward Aldwell and Carl Schachter for reference, so consider that a blanket citation for the statements I'm about to make. Also, a quick disclaimer. I was trained in what you might call a Western or European musical tradition, and I tend to think and describe things in those terms. There are other musical traditions from other continents that I am not familiar with. In fact, if somebody out there made a video similar to this one, describing how to translate one of those traditions into Chuck, I would be fascinated to see it. Okay. Anyways, so, consider a piano keyboard. As we mentioned in the earlier video, there is a repeating pattern of white and black keys that repeats every 12 keys. Each of these keys has a letter associated with it. If we start with this key and name it C, then each of the white keys gets another letter. We've got C, D, E, F, and G, and then the last two are A and B. Note that we skipped the black keys here, but for completeness' sake, let's add those back in. We've got a C sharp, a D sharp, an F sharp, a G sharp, and an A sharp. Alternatively, we could call those black notes D flat, E flat, G flat, A flat, and B flat. For what it's worth, when you have two pitches or chords that sound the same but have different names, we say that they are enharmonic. For instance, the note D flat is enharmonic to the note C sharp. So if we take this set of 12 keys, the set that repeats, we can call that set a chromatic set of pitches. And if you play them back to back, you get what we'll call a chromatic scale. If we rename these pitches to numbers, specifically like this, we can see how the numbers stack up inside that chromatic scale. If we write a Chuck script that loops through those numbers, we can hear what a chromatic scale sounds like. Now, when we listen to music that uses the rules of what we'll call common practice Western harmony, we tend not to use that entire set of notes. The standard move is to exclude five out of the 12 notes. The notes that get excluded, not by coincidence, are the black keys if your root note is C, and we'll get back to what we mean by root note in a minute. For now, let's note that what we get if we exclude those five black notes is sort of an asymmetric arrangement of notes and steps between those notes. Originally, in the chromatic scale, there was the same distance between each note. Now that we're excluding the black keys, the harmonic distance between each note and the next varies based on whether or not there used to be a black key there. In musical terms, the harmonic distance between two notes is called the interval between those notes, and it gets measured in what we're going to call steps. The distance between C and D is called a whole step, and the distance between C and C sharp is called a half step. So without the black notes and only white keys, observe that when we move from C to D or from D to E, we are moving a whole step, but when we move from E to F, that's only a half step. Then F to G is a whole step, G to A is a whole step, A to B is a whole step, but then B to C is another half step. This arrangement of two whole steps, a half step, three more whole steps, and another half step turns what we call the chromatic scale into what's called the diatonic scale. This diatonic arrangement of steps goes way back, at least to the Middle Ages in Europe, when they were the basis for what were called the church modes, and its peculiar balance of stability and instability creates a sort of set of melodic and harmonic tendencies that defines the Western tonal system. I did a bit of research into the history of where major and minor came from, and it is interesting, but it gets kind of involved and it has nothing to do with Chuck. So leave a comment, I guess, if you want to know more about how the medieval church's version of church modes turned into the scales that we currently use. But for now, let's skip that and go straight to talking about major and minor scales. The first thing I want to observe is that 
If we have switched from using a chromatic scale to a diatonic scale, we ditch the black keys, and thus if we are writing in chuck, we will also need to ditch the corresponding numbers when playing a scale. One way to do that would be to define a major scale as an array. To do that, we'll just put all the numbers that are on white keys into an array. Then if we iterate through that array and chuck the array member into our pitch, then we will play a major scale. A scale for our purposes is a set of notes that you play as a rising or descending set of tones back to back until you hit the same tone again. A major scale, if you are using all white keys and no black keys, starts at C and ends at the next C. Let's play that again. A minor scale, if you are using all the white keys and no black keys, starts at A and ends at the next A. Now, if we wanted to find a minor scale in Chuck, a way to do that would be to work backwards down the keys and put some negative numbers in there. The B below the C is negative 1, the A sharp there is negative 2, and the A down there is negative 3. We won't use the negative 2 because our diatonic scale doesn't use black keys, so our minor scale would start at minus 3, minus 1, and then end at 9, like so. So now let's delve in a little bit to these terms, major and minor. To do that, we're going to talk some more about intervals. If we're looking at a keyboard, the distance between the first note and the second note is called a second. The distance between the first note and the third note is called a third. This continues all the way up to the seventh, and then the eighth note, which has the same name as the first, is called an octave. Now, if you've been paying attention, there's a question that needs resolved. Okay, the distance between a C and a D is a second, and the distance between a D and E is a second. Is the distance between an E and an F a second? How can that be when we know that D to E is a whole step, while E to F is a half step? The answer is that they are both intervals of a second, but a second that is comprised of a whole step is called a major second, and a second that is comprised of a half step is called a minor second. Intervals have what is called a quality. The distance between C and D is a second with a quality of major, and the distance between E and F is a second with a quality of minor. There are a few different qualities of interval, and they are named according to how consonant or dissonant they are. Consonance, in this case, refers to how stable the interval sounds if you play the two sounds at the same time. The interval of an octave, or the interval of two instruments playing the same note, which is called a unison, is perfectly consonant, and its quality is called perfect. That is, the interval between a note and the note an octave above it is called a perfect octave. Fifths are also referred to as perfect if there are seven half steps between them. So C to G is a perfect fifth, as is D to A and E to B. The intervals between seconds are usually referred to as major or minor, as we said a minute ago. Major and minor intervals are less consonant than perfect intervals. That is also the case with thirds, sixths, and sevenths. There's just one more weird interval to account for in a major key, which we can demonstrate by playing all the fifths back to back. They are all perfect fifths until you reach the last one, which is between B and F. This is a fifth because of the distance between the keys, but it is not a perfect fifth because it is comprised of six half steps instead of seven. This is neither major nor minor. Instead, we refer to this as a diminished fifth. This is also called a tritone, and it's sort of the grain of sand in the oyster of the diatonic scale that produces the pearl that is our system of major and minor keys. B and F don't sound good together. So there are rules for resolving that dissonance, and that results in those tendencies I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's talk about chords. Chords are collections of notes that are played together. The most basic version of a chord is called a triad. A triad consists of a root, a third, and a fifth. Or, put another way, they consist of a root, a third, and a third of that third. If the triad contains a perfect fifth, then the quality of the triad will be the quality of the interval between the root and the third. So, if our triad is C, E, G, C to G is a perfect fifth, so we use the quality of the third. It's a major third, so C, E, G is a major triad. The triad D, F, A also has a perfect fifth, so again we use the quality of the third. D to F is a minor third, so D, F, A is a minor triad. As we go up the major scale in triads, we see the following. It starts with a major triad, followed by two minor triads, followed by a major triad, a second major triad, a minor triad, and then one last chord that is neither minor nor major because it doesn't contain a perfect fifth. That tritone is back again. The fifth in the triad based on that seventh scale degree is a diminished fifth, and we refer to this as a diminished triad. Now, it's common when analyzing chords in a song to refer to the Roman numeral names of those chords. This becomes very helpful when describing how complicated chord progressions behave, but it's a simple concept to start out. Each Roman numeral name corresponds to the scale degree at its root. So, 1 is 1, 2 is 2, and so on, all the way up to 7. 
So referring back to what we said a minute ago, in major, one is major, two is minor, three is minor, four is major, five is major, six is minor, and seven is diminished. If we go back to the first theory video, we can listen to this chord progression and, knowing what we know now, we know how I decided which triad qualities to use. The first chord is Roman numeral one, which is major. The second goes down to the sixth chord, which is minor. The next chord is the four chord, which is major. And lastly, we have the five chord, which is also major. I want to talk about how minor keys work as well, but this video is already containing a lot of information. So let's wrap it here and I will come back to minor keys in a future video. I also recognize that I blew past a ton of concepts in a small amount of time. So please feel free to comment if I said anything confusing or if you have any questions. In this video, we described how music can be described as scale degrees and explored the nature of the major scale. In our next video, I'm going to do something a little easier and talk about the pulse oscillator Eugen.